Hello and welcome to the More Perfect Union, the podcast that offers real debate without the hate. I'm Kevin Kelton. And tonight, though, we are not going to be debating. We're going to be having a very interesting conversation with someone that I've wanted to get on this podcast for a long time. Jessica Walraff is here. Hi. Some of you who listen to us regularly should recognize Jessica's name. I've talked about her many, many times. Jessica is my fiance. We are soon to be married. And she has a very interesting past that I've actually purloined for the novel that I've been plugging on the show, Pas de deux, which is based on our relationship and much of it, in fact, I'd say the first half of the book, is based on Jessica's life and exploits as a professional ballerina working all across Europe. So we wanted to have Jessica on to talk about that a little bit and to find out what it's like to be an actual ballerina living and working in Europe and being on some of the greatest stages in the world. So Jessica, with that, obviously you must have started at a young age. What age do you remember starting to dance and realizing that was something that you wanted to do for the rest of your life? I started dancing when I was five years old. I actually had been taken by my mom to uh, see American Ballet Theater in Detroit, Michigan at a summer festival outside, and they were performing Giselle. And I was so haunted by the Willies, who are these spirits who all died of a broken heart And so the story goes, my mom told me I stood up uh, during the second act and said, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be. I want to be a dancer. Um, And so my journey started then. Okay. So you got your parents to enroll you in a ballet school of some kind and you started going. Do you remember the name of the school and where it was? No. My first dance school, I was just going once a week. For many years, it was a pretty, what I'd call rinky-dink dance school. And um, so it was just on Saturdays. And it was not until I was nine, almost 10, that I auditioned for the Pennsylvania Ballet School. They were starting a new program where they were going to start young dancers coming every day or five days a week instead of just once or twice a week. And I actually got accepted to that program and I got a scholarship. So that's when my journey really took off in terms of ballet. And this was in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, right? Yeah, in Philadelphia. Okay. And something that you've told me that I think the audience would be interested in, obviously it takes a lot of dedication to become as good as you are. I always liken what you did to being, you know, a professional basketball or baseball player, someone who has to really dedicate their life and dedicate their mind to that kind of discipline. You told me that one of the schools that you went to, one of the ballet schools, was not really very local to you, and it made it a little bit challenging to get there. What were those journeys like to get to school to do what you loved? So after, I can't remember about how many years I was with the Pennsylvania Ballet School, and my teacher's Margarita de Sa and John White, who had been principals at the Cuban National Ballet and had defected. Uh, John White was American, but he was living in Cuba. And once when they were on tour in New York, uh, she actually defected to America. And they were teaching ballet at the Pennsylvania Ballet School and then opened their own ballet school in Narberth, Pennsylvania. And so I left with them. And in order to get in junior high, high school, in order to get to my ballet school, after school, I'd, I would have to take a tra- a bus and then a train to get to my ballet school and take at least two classes. And then uh, oftentimes my stepdad, Chuck, would pick me up because it was too late to get a train and I'd get home really late at night around 9 or 9.30 and still had to have dinner and do my homework. Yeah. You told me that sometimes you had to take a bus and two trains and then walk like, what, 20, oh, that 25 was, uh, that blocks? Was, that was in New York. So oh, okay. I, I would. I also, when I was preparing for a competition I did later in my late teens or when I was 16, it was an international competition called the Prix de Lausanne. And I had been working once a week or sometimes on school holidays with a ballet teacher, a Romanian teacher named Madame Darvash. And so in order to get to that school, I would have to get up at 4.30 in the morning. And my stepdad, who always was one taking me to the train, he would drive me to the train. I would take a local train from Chestnut Hill to downtown Philadelphia. And then I would get the train from Philly to New York. And because I felt like walking was my warm up, instead of getting off at around 50th Street, I would get off at um, Madison Square Garden, which is, I guess, 34th. 34th Street. And I'd walk all the way up to 50th before taking two or three classes. Wow. And you were how old at that time? Mm, 
14. Wow, 15. unbelievable. Yeah. Okay, so you're training, you're going to high school, and junior high and then high school, and you're training, and then you decide that you've heard about, obviously, the Prix de Lausanne. And- no, I-, I didn't hear about it. So I'm very short, <laughs> though I don't feel short. <laughs> and so my teachers, Margarita de San and John White, were trying to be very strategic towards the end of my schooling about how I would be seen. So instead of going to a basic cattle call audition where there are hundreds and hundreds of dancers, they knew about this international ballet competition in Europe called the Prix de Lausanne, the Prize of Lausanne. And it was teenage dancers coming at the end of their finishing years, almost the end of high school. And if you won the competition, you would win a full scholarship to one of the leading ballet schools in the world. So it would be American Ballet Theater School or New York City Ballet School or the Opera Paris or the Royal Ballet. And maybe there was one other, I can't remember. And so they spoke to me, spoke to my parents and thought that would be a better way for me to be seen on stage instead of in a studio in a general audition. Okay. So you enter this Prix de Lausanne. You had to go to Europe. Yes. My first time in Europe to Switzerland. And you're 16 years old. 16 years old. And what happened there? So I made it to the semifinals. So our, our expenses were reimbursed. Yay. And then I ended up winning first prize. And when you win first prize, you get to choose which school you want to go to. And I had always had a romantic relationship with France, and I wanted to go to the Paris Opera School. But there was another dancer who was from Paris. And in order to get into the Opera of Paris company, you need to go through the school. And so her teacher mentor asked me, would I take a different scholarship so that she could get into that company? And that was fine for me. I was young. I didn't know. And I I chose the Royal Ballet School in London. Okay. And was that uh, where you were paired up with Kuhn? No. So at the same time, the boy, young man who won the gold medal, the top prize in the men's section, um, Kuhn Onzia from Belgium, from the School of the Royal Ballet of Flanders, he was also quite small. And the director of the Royal Ballet of Flanders wanted he and I to dance together as a partnership. So she came up to me and offered me a contract in the fall to their company. So I ended up not going to London, being young, being hungry. I thought, oh, I want to be on stage. Um, So I took the contract and never ended up going to London. And then later that year, you were in the... um the International Ballet Competition in Jackson, Mississippi. So, yes. So so when I went to Antwerp in Belgium, uh, they wanted us to perform together, to compete together at the International Ballet Competition in Jackson, Mississippi. So I went that summer before joining the company. I went that summer at 16 and a half, maybe I had turned 17 by then, to train with him to go to Jackson, Mississippi. And we won uh, the silver medal in the juniors. So now you've scored big in two international competitions, two of the largest ballet competitions for junior dancers. What happens next? Uh, That summer, after the competition, I'm home um, preparing to leave for Europe. But many different things were also going on in my family life. So there was a lot of kind of turmoil um, as well. But I was just preparing to go to Europe. Okay, yeah. so uh, before we get to the professional part of your dance career, I want to stop and talk a little bit about what was going on in your family life, because I think a lot of people think, oh, well, she was just a young girl, she loved to dance, her mom and her stepdad were very supportive, but there was a lot more going on, right? A lot more that actually motivated you and maybe made you make choices that you wouldn't have otherwise made. Yes, um, so... My father, not my stepfather, but my father suffered for many, many years from bipolar disease. And at some point, my mother left him and, you know, life was crazy for us when he was going through this. And he, at some point, had to be committed. It was just a very crazy, difficult time in my young life. Um, And so the more serious things got at home, I think the more I kind of fled to the ballet studio and buried myself or lost myself in my ballet. So sometimes in hindsight, I think everyone thinks, how could you have gone to Europe at such a young age at 16, 17? And there were no iPhones, no computers. You didn't have constant contact with family. You were on your own. And, you know, in hindsight, I feel like I was fleeing difficult things that had happened in my past. And uh, yeah, so that was a little bit my motivation as well. Okay. So you're 17. Now, remember, this is 1979, way before cell phones, way before 
email and the internet where it was easy to communicate with people. Your parents, which this just amazes me, they had the, the courage and the foresight to let you leave high school, move to Europe, and pursue a dance career at the age of 17. And again, as you said, you're a diminutive young lady going to Europe all alone. What was that experience like? Well, first of all, I didn't give them a choice. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I have a strong character, and I was so determined that ballet was my life, and I was being given, I had worked for and earned them, but lots of opportunities. So how I expressed it to my mom was that, I'll never get another chance. And I think she was also scrambling and struggling in her life after everything we had gone to with my father and kind of keeping my other siblings in our life afloat, so to speak. So as she said, uh, I didn't really give her a choice. It was, in hindsight, again, it was very painful on my mom. Once I was in Europe, I didn't touch base at home a lot. Again, there weren't phones. It was very hard. There were phones, but in order to call America, you had to go to the post office and you had to basically wait online. At times, I would have to wait online for like 45 minutes to get an international calling cell. And maybe it would have been a month that I had not spoken to my mom. So by the time I spoke to her, I was in tears because I actually missed everyone so much, especially her. So I know that was a very painful time in my mom's life. And now, you know, being a mother, I can't even imagine um, what she went through. This is all very fascinating to me. Again, I can't imagine, you know, I went to college at 18 and I moved from Long Island to Boston and that was like a giant life move. So the idea of at 17 going across the ocean and living, you had your own flat, right? I had my own flat, yes. I was renting a, a room from an old lady in Belgium, yes. <laughs> and you're and you're now a brand new dancer at the Royal Ballet of Flanders. In Antwerp. Belgium, and yeah. do you remember some of the early days? Do you remember what your first role was? Do you remember any of that? Not so much. I mean, they weren't well-known ballets that we did. They had their own kind of house choreographer. So I, I remember bits and pieces, but not so much. I just remember more, quite frankly, <laughs> the loneliness of being alone in my apartment, but still having, um, I don't know, the mental prowess or however you call it, the strength to like make my way in the world. The ballet studio was my home. I needed to get to the ballet studio. Therefore, you know, I worked hard, but it was kind of where I was most comfortable or most comfortable on stage, like the cliche kind of thing. Talk about the progression for a dancer. I would imagine you star in the uh, the corps de danse. Is that corps de ballet? Corps de ballet. Yeah, corps de ballet. And how long do you take there, and and how do you move up, and then what's the progression in terms oh, the of progression is normally corps de ballet, and then some companies they have different names for it, demi soloist or half soloist, and then full soloist, and then maybe principal dancer. You know, there many, every company has slightly different grades of of elevating in the company. I was hired at the uh, Royal Ballet Flanders as a demi soloist, but again, I'm so small that you can't really put me in a corps de ballet because <laughs> everyone's even, and I'm not. So I don't think she's <laughs> that small, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and what is the daily routine like? You're working again. You're a professional. This is your full time job. What time did you have to be at the ballet studio? How much rehearsal was there? If it was show night, what was your your routine. Okay, so if it was a regular rehearsal day without performance, your class would usually be starting at 10 o'clock. And a class was usually about an hour and a half, which just training, keeping up your ballet technique, because classical dancers like a classical musician need to keep up their technique. Um, and then rehearsals would start. And depending on what ballets you were cast in, you were at the ballet center, wherever the rehearsal studios were, from anywhere from two hours to eight hours, of course, with a break for, you know, a meal or a cigarette and a coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I smoked at the time. So many dancers in Europe were smoking, which is kind of crazy. Uh, yes, and on a on a day where there was performance, you would have class again at 10, and then maybe a short rehearsal segment, but they would stop earlier in the day so you could go home and rest and have a meal and then be back at the theater. I always tended to want to be early at places, so if the performance was at 8, I would be at the theater maybe at 5.30 or 6, you know, time to get your makeup done. Maybe you did your own makeup, maybe it was done, maybe you had hair that had to be done, and there was always a warm-up class. You might rehearse a little bit more, and then the performance. And what were some of your favorite performances or your favorite ballets? What, what, what roles did you love to play? I mean, I know I've seen photos of you playing Marie in Nutcracker. Yeah, but that was later in Germany. I mean, the ones that I think of in, in Ballet Théâtre Français de Nancy, so in France, we did a ballet that many people might not know more obscure. We did a ballet from John Butler named Itineraries. It was a beautiful kind of neoclassic ballet. 
I also did a ballet called Inconsequentials from uh, Agnes de Mill. That was a beautiful ballet that we later performed in Paris at the Châtelet. We also did Four Temperaments from Balanchine. We had a pretty diverse repertoire. And then there was a ballet that we did from John Neumeyer, who was the director of the Hamburg Ballet, called Variations of Petrushka. So it was basically the music from Petrushka, but in piano form. It was more contemporary form of the ballet Petrushka. And I fell in love with the ballet, in love with the choreography. And this was maybe three and a half, four years of being with the Ballet Théâtre Français de Nancy. And I realized I wanted to maybe leap to a bigger company. The Hamburg Ballet was a bigger, more renowned company than the French Ballet Theater. And um, so that started my journey of trying to get a contract with that company. Okay. And we're going to talk a little bit, we're going to talk much more about your experiences in Hamburg, where a lot of your life happened at that time in, in your life. But before we do that, I want to tell our listeners, if you're interested in seeing Jessica dance, and I should have probably mentioned this earlier in the program, you could go to kevinkelton.com, that's my website, and click on the tab that says Ballet down to the far right. And if you click on the Ballet tab, you can see videos of Jessica dancing at the Prix de Lausanne and I think also at Jackson. And right. she's amazing, dancing in two different competitions. So yes, go to kevinkelton.com, click on ballet, and you can see her there. And what I'm going to do now is we're going to take a commercial break, and I'm going to give you 30 seconds to go look at that, and we'll be right back with more of Jessica Walraff. And we're back. So now at this point in your career, you uh, took a contract with the Hamburg Ballet. How old do you think you were? I was 21 Going on 22, but that's an interesting journey. Can I talk about it? Absolutely. So I was invited back many years after I did the Prix de Lausanne. They tend to invite former winners back a couple years after they've won. And there was a dancer who was also in the French Ballet Theater named Patrick Armand. Patrick Armand was an incredible dancer. He won the competition the year or two after I won. And he came to the French Ballet Theater and eventually went to London So Patrick and I danced in uh, Nancy, Balanchine's Tchaikovsky pas de deux together many times and loved dancing and did it so well together. So we were invited back to Lausanne a few years after we had won to dance as the past, you know, the former winners. And I had previously auditioned for the Hamburg Ballet, but again, it was more that catacall in the studio audition where there were hundreds of people and I'm so tiny and I was kind, I was not cut right away but I was not given a contract and I was very disappointed, very disappointed. And so later when I was, you know, maybe it was six months later or however later it was that I was invited back to Lausanne, John Neumeyer, the director of the Hamburg Ballet, was the president of the jury. And his second hand or his, our ballet master from the Hamburg Ballet, the ballet master from the Hamburg Ballet, Truman Finnan, Truman Finney, who is no longer <laughs> with us, who's an incredible ballet master, He had wanted John to take me when I auditioned. He really liked me as a dancer and supported me. So he was there at Lausanne, and he came up to me and said, this might be your chance to get a contract with the Hamburg Ballet. Are you still interested? And I said, I am so interested. So John saw me on stage instead of in the studio. And then I was sent, at the time when I got back to France, a telegram saying that there's a contract for me if I want it. I still have kept that telegram somewhere in my belongings. And so I left Nancy mid-season and I joined the Hamburg Ballet that January, whatever the date was. I don't know, but I was now 21 turning 22, or I just turned 22. Okay. So you moved to Germany. You're dancing now in the Hamburg Ballet. My third country. By the way, when you went to Europe, you spoke a little French before you you moved, I I didn't speak French. I mean, I had studied French. I was always a Francophile, so I studied French in junior high. In high school, I studied a little bit of Spanish, but I always loved French, and I would try to see French films and try to read in French and eat French food. I was just a true Francophile. So by the time I got to France, I had the radio on all the time, the television all the time, and I was living with a couple who did not speak English. And so it was like being just bombarded with French. And about three months later, I finally started speaking French. But it was at the time when many people in France, especially in the smaller cities, did not speak English. And I have an affinity for language, not for math. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So you learn French, and that helped when you were dancing with a French company. And then you take a contract with a German company in um, Hamburg. Had you spoken German? Did no, you- no, no. I didn't speak any German. And um, the very interesting thing about Hamburg is that it's a company with so many different nationalities. It's something that John Neuermeyer really loved. So I think at the time when I was dancing in Hamburg, I think there were probably 13 different nationalities. The main language spoken was actually English because there were so many different languages being spoken. And many people spoke German, but I at the time was coming from France. So a lot of dancers thought I was French because I was kind of staying <laughs> with the French clique. Okay, but you uh, eventually did become fluent. You want to say something quickly in German? So I became not fluent, fluent. German is always a little bit of a struggle for me. It's work. But how I learned German was basically I met an actor from the National Theater, the Schauspielhaus in Hamburg, and I started going to the National Theater, though everything was in German. So I saw all these Shakespeare plays in German and um, other plays uh, from Edmund. What's the director's name? The writer Edmund. Oh, I'm forgetting his name. Anyway. Don't worry about it. And so I just, again, bump, you know, surrounded myself with so much German and having an affinity, and I started studying on my own and taking books. So I'm not fluent in German, but I can speak it. It's work. Uh, it makes my head spin a little bit, but yeah, I can do it. <laughs> Folks, I have seen her have full conversations with other yeah. people in German. She's fluent in yeah. German. <laughs> it's work. <laughs> and there was one particular German that you got very close to. In fact, didn't you end up marrying a German man? Oh, well, that's the, that's the guy that was the <laughs> I'm trying to lead you yeah, into that okay. story. So, so how did okay. that happen? It's, so, <laughs> hold on. This I, I happen to know Jessica's history, and this is an interesting story, and I'm trying to lead her down this path. Tell us a little bit about how you came to fall in love. So um, my former husband, his name is Diego Valraff, and he's half Colombian, half German. And he was in the National Theater, and he was always crazy about the ballet, and he had been with an American dancer for very long, for many years, but she had left the company and he was whatever broken hearted and stayed away from the ballet. But at some point he started coming back. And that was when he came back was when I had just joined the company. So he asked the dancers, who is that? Blah, 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 blah. And we met. And then one day we met at, I was after, after rehearsal, there wasn't English television. There weren't a lot of movies in English, but there was a video store that had videos in English. And so that's where many of the American dancers would go to get some kind of English content. So Diego, knowing the American dancers of the company, he thought, where would he meet me? And so we ended up going to that video store and we kind of flirted for many hours, not many hours, but looking around the, the movies. And then I was looking for The Shining because I was going to be inviting many of the American dancers to my apartment to watch The Shining for the umpteenth time. And I invited him to come. And long story short, that night, 20 years later, we were together. <laughs> <laughs> Not 20 years later. Well, for 20 years. Oh, you were, tw- yeah, yes, they were yes, together yes, for, yeah, 20 yeah, years. for 20 years. Yeah. Right. And had a son and uh, still are good friends. But to my good fortune, that marriage didn't last. <laughs> Okay, so you you have this career. It lasted some 10 or 11 years, I believe, maybe 12 years. Well, well from the time I was 16, 17 to when I retired at the ripe old age, ripe old age of uh, 28. And you danced in some very special places for some very special audiences, right? In Copenhagen, who did you dance for? I danced for the Queen. <laughs> right. And got introduced to her in her box, yes. Where else? Like, what other countries? What were some of the big opera houses or dance uh, houses? I danced in many of the big... I mean, we toured South America, Buenos Aires, um, Teatro de Colón, which is one of the biggest the biggest theater in Buenos Aires. Paris Opera. I, I've danced at many of the theaters in Paris. The Teatro de Champs-Élysées, the Châtelet, the Teatro de la Ville... I did miss the tour to Moscow because I had my one big dance injury where I came down from a jump and ripped one of my ligaments in my left ankle, which kind of ended my career almost, or practically. So I do have regrets that I did miss that tour, never got to dance. They did dance in the Bolshoi Theater, and for many dancers, that's kind of a highlight. Yeah. But there was another highlight of your career. Now, Americans may or may not be familiar with some of the the bigger names that you danced with. But there's one dance name that almost anyone who's over 40 should recognize. Who is this famous dance legend that you actually toured with? Rudolf Nureyev. You danced a pas de deux with Rudolf Nureyev? Well, I danced a couple different ballets with him. So Nureyev liked to sometimes partner with a smaller company 
to present himself in these different ballets that he wanted to dance. But instead of contracting himself with a big company like the Opera of Paris, the Royal Ballet, he used some smaller companies. So the French Ballet Theater, we did a couple of tours with Nureyev. And I'll never forget, we were on tour in Italy at some point when we heard that Nureyev was going to be appearing in the audience because he, we were going to be doing these tours with him and he was going to be choosing the dancers that he wanted to dance with. So it was pretty intense backstage. <laughs> and I am very lucky and humbled that I was chosen to be one of the dancers that danced with him. I got to dance Apollo from Balanchine and I got to dance Petrushka, the very famous ballet from Diaghilev. And I think those are the two ballets I danced with him, yeah. And then your career started to wind down after that ankle injury? Yes. That ligament? Yes. So after I ripped my the ligament in my ankle, I had to be off for three months. And I had my foot in a brace, not knowing if I was going to really be able to get back on point shoes. My orthopedic doctor had said I probably should not have surgery if I still wanted to dance because I might not get my full extension back on my point shoes. So I should first try it like that. If that didn't work, then maybe we would do surgery. Um, so I did a lot of PT. I got very involved in Pilates. That's when kind of, you know, I had been doing Pilates before then, but I really got highly involved in Pilates to keep the rest of my body strong. And that summer, Diego and I, my uh, former husband, he had also suffered an accident. It was ironic, the timing, and he had ripped a major ligament in his shoulder and had to have major surgery and a metal plate put in his shoulder. And we came to the States and we came to LA and we we're going to go to San Francisco and then do a little family reunion and take a trip with my family to Hawaii. And when we were in LA, I said to him, can you imagine if next year we were living here? And it had always been his dream to live in America. I was the true expatriate. I thought I'm never coming back. I liked the healthcare and things that I enjoyed in Europe and just the quality of life and the culture. And he, you know, got a little angry at me and said, don't joke about that. It means too much <laughs> to me. But then I realized I was finally possibly ready. I had experienced life without ballet for three months. And that even though I was, you know, not that old in regular life, you know, a dancer 27, 28 is kind of getting up there. And so I suddenly thought, maybe I'm ready to stop. But I wanted to prove to myself that I could get back on stage. So after that summer, I got back to Hamburg. I had started training again, got back on stage. And then... On tour one day, I just realized I had always made a pact with myself. When I stop believing in ballet 500%, that's the day I stop because there's so many dancers who want to do it and there's not a lot of opportunity and you just have to believe in it 500% because it's a hard life. And I realized, I said to my person who was in my dressing room, like Gilma Bustillo, who used to be with the American Ballet Theater and then came to the Hamburg Ballet, my hair is rejecting my bun, my feet are rejecting my point shoes. I, and from that Week on, I the following week, I gave my resignation. Very kind of quick and... Uh... Okay, so you moved to the United States. The professional ballet part of your journey now is in the past. We'll skip through the 20 years of marriage. Well, but except, you know, I moved to the United States, and within the first few months, it was the Rodney King riots and the big earthquake we had, whatever year that right, was. Right, that was, so it was 94. Lot was going on. Boys in the Hood was the movie that was big at the time. Yeah, yeah all right. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's it's the early 1990s. You're yeah. living in Los Angeles. You made the transition from ballet to a Pilates instructor. Yeah, I was suddenly hired in four studios right away because Pilates was just starting to get popular, but there were no certification programs yet. And I had been doing it and apprenticing in the studio that I was working out in in Hamburg. So I got hired right away in four studios, which was kind of crazy. And eventually you... Uh... I eventually, I, I bought into one of the studios that I was um, really enjoying and having some success in. And the owner wanted to leave LA. And so she offered it to me. And so I actually got to buy the studio with what's called my Munich money. So you pay very high taxes when you're in Germany. But as a foreigner, if you leave after a certain amount of years you get a portion of that money back, which is that's the money for your social security. Right. So I got a big chunk of money back, which enabled me, helped me to buy this studio. Great. Okay. And you're doing Pilates in Los Angeles. You have your son. You're married. At some point, the marriage comes to an end. Uh, you start dating again. How old were you and what was that like? Uh, I think I was 44. Yeah. Okay. And you uh, very quickly got involved with an attorney <laughs> in the uh, Los Angeles area, uh, were with him for many years. And then that relationship came to its logical conclusion. And what happened then? <laughs> and then, <laughs> that, 
that that relationship there were many beautiful parts but it was a little bumpy and then I decided um okay I'm gonna kind of go back online again and I was about to take a trip and I you know I hate the online dating and writing about myself I'm not a writer I don't like to write myself about myself I don't like to put myself out there like that but I just quickly put something out didn't write a lot about my profile profile put a couple of pictures out and then I got this beautiful response from this comedy writer <laughs> <laughs> Whatever happened to him? I don't know. Okay. Lost in Texas. So Jessica and I did meet online through online dating. For those of you who've heard about it and are dubious, it does work. I wrote to Jessica. She wrote back. She was just about to leave for, I think, an, an extended like eight-day or ten-day no, trip. No, we, a uh, week trip to Tucson, Arizona. Yeah, kind of a, a family thing that we do. Okay. So while she was gone, we kept communicating through emails. And, of course, I like to try to amuse someone when I was writing to them. And I guess I must have he amused you. He seduced me with his words. He's a beautiful writer, a lot of heart, and uh, he was beautiful. And when Jessica got back in town, we set up our first date. We went to the Annenberg Space, which is a museum. Annenberg Space for photography. For me, dating is so difficult, and I thought it's always better to have something to do. And I already knew I was falling in love with Kevin, so I wanted to have something nice to do where we could walk and talk and kind of get to know each other in person and then have dinner and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so my memory, and now I'll become part of the interview here, so my memory is I'd been, you know, I had also been married, also divorced, had a couple of kids, dating when you're in your 40s or early 50s. I think at that time I was in my, yeah, I was definitely in my 50s, you know, is very tricky and you have relationships. There's a lot of rejection. There's a lot of disappointment, but you never know what's going to happen on a new first date. So what I remember, Jess, is that we went to this place, the Annenberg space that you had suggested. I had never been there. I kind of knew what you looked like from your photographs, but I meet you out front. You're wearing a because it's it's it was winter in Los Angeles, and even though Los Angeles doesn't get super cold, cold, it has its colder days. And Jessica, you were wearing a long, like I think it was purple winter coat, one of those dark puffy blue. dark blue, <laughs> one of those like Michelin coats. She no, looked like it wasn't, the Michelin. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> and so I had no idea what she looked like from the neck down. But like I said, I had seen enough pictures that I knew she was going to be cute, and she was cute. And then we talked, and then we went into the Annenberg space, started looking around, and we noticed that in one of the rooms, they were showing a film. Well, like there's a, always a film. So yeah. There's, so so the, the, the exhibit is like in a circular outside, and in the inside circle is a film about the photographers, about the photography. Right, about the particular exhibit. And so we sit down in this, this darkened room on a couple of, I think, director's chairs, mm -hmm. And we're watching this film. And again, we'd only been together now maybe 15, 20, 25 minutes. While we're watching the film, I feel Jessica rest her head on my shoulder. And this is a first date. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm not used to things progressing like this. And I was very happy about it. But we had so many wonderful conversations. So I felt like I knew him. And it just felt like, ah, you know. <laughs> So, yeah, so we began dating and, you know, soon after that became an item. And now it is eight years later. Uh, we are engaged. We were going to get married before the, the pandemic hit. Well, we didn't know the pandemic was going to hit, but we had plans to get married. That had to be delayed. Then we moved to Texas. And if you've listened to this podcast, you know about that journey from my perspective. Well, let's talk to you. What is your perspective about moving from Los Angeles to Texas? Oh, gosh. Mm. <laughs> It's, it's been a challenging change, but there's many beautiful things about Texas that I wasn't expecting. And the main thing is actually the people that we've been surrounded with by teaching Pilates in Los Angeles. I had many wonderful clients, but our studio was in Beverly Hills and there's a certain entitlement <clears throat> about that area. And I have to say the graciousness of the Southerners is quite incredible, remarkable, wonderful. The niceness, even people who come from away from Texas, from other cities, they start to adopt this way of being. When we would walk around our neighborhood, people would all wave hi to us. And I'd be very cynical and I'd pull my hat down. And I'd say, Kevin, grumble, grumble. They don't mean it. And they actually really do mean it. So your days are lighter because people who you're surrounded by really do care, really do say hi or 
when we've had some, um, when we went through the big freeze last year, we were not prepared. Our neighbors came over and brought us supplies. So that, that piece has been quite remarkable. I miss the diversity of Los Angeles. I miss the ocean. I live close to the ocean. I miss the wide variety of healthy food I can get. But um, I've had some unexpected, beautiful surprises here in Texas. Including finding a Pilates studio and company that you work for? Yes, that you enjoy, yes. That you I actually came here to semi-retire, but ended up meeting someone who had been certified in our studio that I used to co-own, Bodyline, in Los Angeles. And she hired me on the spot, and I actually, um, it has reinvigorated my teaching, probably teaching a little too much right now. Kevin will complain <laughs> all the time, but it's been wonderful. So now you're dating me, and as I've said to our friends many times, you know, if you're a, a musician, a songwriter, you can write a love song to the woman of your dreams. If you're a poet, you can write a poem. If you're a painter, you can make a beautiful painting or an etching of that person. My skill is with words. So what I did was I started writing a book about you and about us, and it's called Pas de Deux. And do you remember the first time I sent you a chapter? Yes. <laughs> Yes. I mean, how many years ago was that? Oh, three, four, five yeah, years. It, was, it, it it just, I had to pull over to the side of the road. It was actually, Kevin described a very intimate moment, which really always brings me back to the essence of us and our deep connection. We do have a very deep connection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I would write this book and it was a lark. It wasn't really a book. I was writing what I called chapters. They were little short stories where I took some of the aspects of Jessica's previous career in ballet and some of the aspects of our dating life, and I kind of melded them. And it, and at a certain point, I started to realize, maybe there's a story here that's going to be of interest to more than two people. So I started working on it as a novel. And uh, just several months ago, I actually published what became known as Pas de Deux, which is, means what? Dance of Two. But he's took a lot of literary license because the initial book that he wrote was, for my taste, a little too close to home. And, <laughs> and there were people that were possibly going to maybe be hurt or offended. Um, I didn't know. And I just wanted to protect them and also to protect my own privacy. So he started making changes. So my life is not at all. I mean, there's right. essences. What, what I would yeah. say is we used milestones in your life as sort of guideposts. Yes. And then I filled in, when you do read the book, because a few of our friends have read it and they'll say to me, well, when you and Jessica did this, I said, no, 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 it wasn't, it wasn't us. No, yeah. Or I never knew she wore such a thing, you know, and they, I'd say, no, no, no. You got to understand, it's fiction. Yeah. It's, a, it's a novel. It's, so it's, we took the essence of my career and our journey together and uh, embellished it or changed it. And added some dramatic plot points that make it a story that will appeal to more than just our family. So um, first of all, I want to thank you for doing this. I've been trying to get Jessica to sit down and do this for years, and finally we were able to do it. What was it like? Well, it's funny because, you know, Diego, my former husband, he, when I stopped dancing, he said to me, oh, the silent years are over. Not that I didn't <laughs> talk, but my expression was always through music, through movement, so as much as I do have a very strong point of view about things, I, I don't have the ease of talking like on a podcast like many people who I, when I listen to the podcast do. Well, I'm sure that the listeners who've uh, stayed with us this long will agree with me that you're very articulate. You did very well. Jessica is very well read. Uh, she loves books. We have books showing up here almost on a daily basis. Thank you, Amazon. And thank you, uh, Book Club of America or whatever that- Book of the Month. Book of the Month Club. <laughs> So yeah, so I am so proud of Jessica and so proud of our relationship. And our, our dog, Rosie, is kind of sneezing in the background. I'm proud of her too. And I thank you for listening to this interview. And I want to remind you that if you are interested in reading a book that kind of parallels her life in a fictional way, but I think captures the essence of what it's like to be a young dancer who had a journey similar to hers, and also a, a young comedy writer who had a journey in television similar to mine and would like to read their love story, please go out and buy, or don't go out because you have to do it online. <laughs> <laughs> don't go anyplace. Just turn on your computer and uh, go to Amazon and look for Pas de Deux by Kevin Kelton. There are unfortunately several books with that title, so you have to look for the one written by me, Kevin Kelton. Order it on Amazon. It's available in hardcover, paperback, and Kindle. It will be available soon on Apple Books. 
as soon as I can figure out their publishing tool. And yeah, that's our story. Anything you want to add before we say goodnight? Okay, she's shaking her head. So the quiet <laughs> years are back. <laughs> So thank you, Jessica Walrath. <laughs> thank you for having me. And thank you, everybody, for listening. This is The More Perfect Union. I hope you like this one-on-one interview, and we'll see you again next time.